a question for, uh, for our colleague from Bulgaria. So, uh, and it goes to the, to the point of uh, really maybe articulating a bit more um, on the issue of um, the, the structure of the political field in Bulgaria. Uh, because we have seen in recent years all these uh, former, formal or, or nominal changes from uh, Orisharsky to Boris, right? Uh, but the, the policies that were implemented or talked about remain in this very narrow framework between, as Paul said, uh, liberal populism and liberal technocracy. And so it, it is kind of strange and interesting uh, that we, we have this very frequent changes within the government, but policies remain really stuck in this narrow liber liberal framework. So could you comment on that? And maybe also, um, uh, if you could say a couple of words on the uh, on, the, on the possibilities of creating really a, a left-wing, uh, but substantially left-wing uh, uh, political political force uh, in Bulgaria, given uh, how how uh, the, the, the the policies are structured uh, at, at this present at this present moment. I also have a question. Would you like to raise it now and then? Yeah, also the can then answer together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very briefly, uh, can you elaborate on your initiative for obligatory voting? Why, why do you yes. think this is a good initiative? Boris, I'm adding a question about the distinction between the first wave of protesters in which you were not involved, but when people in Varna burned themselves in desperation, and how you, as your movement in the second wave of protest, compare yourself, because I know there are political distinctions of Broadly, those were left-wing protests against the right-wing government, and yours were more center-right-wing protests against the left-wing government. So, if you could just elaborate on that from your perspective. Okay. Walk around. The new government of Bulgaria right now is a very, very, very strange coalition. There, there. Uh, four parties in it. Uh, first, uh, the uh, last year's ruling party, yeah, with Boyko Borisov, who is now the, the new old prime minister, uh, with uh, the reformist bloc. Uh, it's a party of uh, a kind of a protesters party because that's the party that supported the second wave of the protests officially. So the, the chairman of the party, he said, I and uh, our party, the reformist bloc, we support the protests and that sort of things. So reformist bloc, that, that's, uh, uh, it's uh, from the right, on the right from the center, Gerb is also from the, to the right, but there are uh, two strange parties. The first one uh, from these four parties, is uh, it's called ABV. It's a new left party created by our former uh, president, who was part of the Bulgarian Co Communist Party. Uh, he he created uh, uh, it's they present themselves as a uh, as a new left, but they aren't. They receive uh, money direct from Russia. And uh, now in, in, a, in a right government, they, they, uh, they actually received a deputy prime minister place. So, two right parties, one left party, and the surprise, uh, ultra-right party. Uh, ultra-right party, uh, they're, uh, they're really radical, and they're also new. Uh, if you have heard about the attack in Bulgaria, the ultra-right party, uh, they support Marine Le Pen in France and uh, uh, Putin in Russia. And that's all. That sort of character. So uh, uh, one left, one ultra-right, and two uh, maybe cent cent central but a bit right parties. Uh, that's a very strange situation. About your uh, s uh, second question, 
uh, about uh, a new, creating a new left party, I think it, it is possible. Because in Bulgaria, uh, monopolists of the left are the former communists. Now, uh, the Bulgarian Communist Party, which ruled for 45 years, is renamed. And its name is Bulgarian Socialist Party. And nobody uh, actually uh, could ignore them. They're uh, usually second or third political party, even now in Bulgaria. But the, the biggest problem of Bulgaria is that Bulgaria is a bit post, no, it's not a bit, it's fully post communistic state. Uh, I mean, the mind of the many of the people. Uh, the, the, the manner of the politicians is post communist So I think many of my friends are uh, left anarchistic. Uh, and uh, I think there, it's, there, are, there, is a, there is a place for a new, new left party. But uh, party is creating with money. And uh, I don't think that uh, the people that are re really believing in left, the new left, are, are ready to create a party. So yes, there are even even the sociologists are, are saying that there there, there is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so my answer personally is yes. Because in Bulgaria there are many many people that are um, that are left, but they don't vote for the socialist part because they are post communists. Uh, I know uh, a friend of mine. He he is uh, uh, teaching law at the university, and he is uh, left, but he voted for Gerb which is right party, because he said, I don't want to vote for communists. I am left, I'm social democrat, but uh, the communists are, I don't like that. So yes, there are people who are voting for something or another. In, yeah, so, yes, uh, about the obligatory voting. We actually did a campaign for a referendum, not for obligatory voting. My personal position is uh, my personal position is actually I don't know. I still don't know. Uh, I'm a bit on the point of the uh, of the yes for. Uh, of, I, I mean, I'm in favor of the obligatory uh, voting, and I'll tell you why. In the Bulgarian case, the biggest problem of the Bulgarian electoral system is buying of votes. The last, uh, the last elections, uh, Transparency International uh, did a report about that, that 10 to 15, 10 to 15 percent of the voters in the last elections are bought by the parties. Their votes are bought. Uh, their, uh, so, um, it's not too cool to say like that, but the majority of the, the, the vote votes are for the ethnic party because of the level of the educational level of the uh, minority, the Turks, the minority of the Turks in Bulgaria. Uh, there are also Roma people who are, um, they're lying to them, uh, and just for uh, let, me, let me tell you uh, what's the price of, of votes in Bulgaria. It's between 20 and 50 leva, that is uh, 10 to 25 euro. Uh, for 10 euro, they're buying your votes. And you, you give them, you, you give them uh, you take them to the parliament and they're their their things. Uh, I don't know. It's a it's a pretty strange situation because if there there wasn't buying the votes, I I could be against obligatory voting. But now, uh, Bulgaria Bulgaria needs 
obligatory voting because of the, the, the votes that are bought by, by the parties. Because if now, uh, from 50% voters, 50, uh, okay, 10% of them, which are the bought votes, are, uh, are 5% from the whole voters. So if 5% are bought, it's more okay than 10%. Okay, so can I just ask that you factor one is... One more question regarding that. Yeah? I mean, how will you, with obligatory voting system, how you will solve the abstention uh, factor? Uh, the people just don't want to vote. I mean, how you will change politically anything with persuading people to go somewhere and, for example, just, you know, not vote for anybody. How, how, how this measure will change? Plan balance. For me, uh, uh, I even if if uh, here in Bulgaria there is obligatory voting, uh, I will prefer to to put the plan balance. Uh, that's I think that's uh, right of everybody to say it. I don't want to vote for your shitty parties. And that's the truth. Many of the parts are really shitty. Uh, uh, so, uh, all the parties I think are really shitty. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you have to, to, to receive the, your right of blank ballot. In Bulgaria, there is no blank ballot. And many of um, uh, many of people that are that want to uh, to put a blank ballot, they are going to to the section uh, for the for the elections, and they just uh, put in a cross over the ballot, then put in it to to uh, box. Uh, so the poli the politicians will see that many of the people are. Are going to use that blank ballot, and I, I, I think that they are afraid of <coughs> blank ballot. But it's right for me, for the people. Uh, I forgot your question. first wave, second wave, but we can oh, talk yeah. about it later. So uh, just, just in 30 seconds. Uh, the first wave, uh, yeah, actually, there are many people that they kill their, themselves through. Uh, uh, yeah, they set themselves on fire. Yeah. Oh, yeah, on fire. Uh, so, I mean, I'm just interested in terms of the reasons. You know, what were the reasons yes, back then? And the, then first, the, the first the first protest. Uh, I must say that the first wave of protest was uh, actually against uh, the prices of the uh, um, electricity, uh, against the high uh, the Taxes. It was more social, economic uh, orientated than the second wave, and even there is a Bulgarian writer, Georgi Guspudinov, who uh, wrote that the second the second wave of protesters are uh, um, how it was the clever and the beautiful, but the first wave were ugly and. Uh, <laughs> Extremely <Yeah>. clever. <laughs> Extremely clever. Uh, so, I think that that opposition isn't good. Uh, and uh, they actually separate the first from the second wave. wave very extremely extreme separation. They say the beautiful and the clever and the ugly and the extremely clever. Uh, so, uh, that's. Thank you. We did, we did go there. Very deeply. Okay. First, um, I would like to hear about the constitution making process in Iceland in a critical way. I mean, the good sides and perhaps what happens. Uh, after. And in terms of Bosnia, I mean, as, as Aida mentioned, the key moment uh, of the protest, in, in a way, is the fact that it 
least for a time being, was able to override the ethnic principle. Right? Uh, it was about socioeconomics, and everyone is having serious socioeconomic problems, uh, regardless of ethnicity. But then, for the future of your efforts, uh, <coughs> defining a network between the local initiatives, sort of bringing forces together, at least on the level of solidarity and perhaps coordination and so on, creating a network of the, of the plenums, protest groups, etc. Uh, the key thing would be to be able to continuously be above that ethnic divide. In that sense, and you mentioned it, Analuka, maybe Bielina, I don't know, District Birchkov. In order to, in the mind of the public, in the, in, from the perspective of the public perception, to be able to ride above the ethnic element, right? You have to have activities there. And then we come back to the question that you also mentioned in Banyaluka, at least from what the activists say, the degree of repression is, uh, their fear of repression and the degree of repression is extreme, right? And uh, it would be a much more, obviously, uh, it would be a much more uh, challenging situation um, so, I don't know if you, you have any ideas of, of how to work o across that. I know that in, there was interest by the activists in Banja Luka to hear from the activists in Maribor, for example, about their methods uh, in terms of uh, dealing with the repression. Uh, I mean, there's a, an NGO here that, that specifically uh, called uh, uh, it's dealing with the, the rights of those that were criminalized in the in the protests here. So, both of I think you know the, it seemed that that type of sort of experience sharing uh, would be useful for them. But there's plenty of other things that you are probably thinking about. So, as I understand, your question was uh, how can we uh, uh, manage with this problem? So, we decided not to talk about that problem. <laughs> so, really, when someone asks, asks about that national ethics uh, problem, we'll ask them, are you hungry? Do you want to work? Do you want better social or economic situation in your city? Focus on that problem. Forget about nationalism, forget about ethnic groups, because that's not what will uh, f fill your uh, stomach, what will feed your children, what will uh, buy you clothes. That's one of the, the possible ways to come over that, that problems. Because I think, that's my opinion, when someone's satisfied with life in his own uh, city, country. That national question is secondary. We can manage that after we um, build a country who, that will uh, provide better life for every citizen, wherever they live. Whether in Banja Luka, Bjelina, Brčko, or Vihać, Sarajevo, Mostar, wherever. That's one way. Actually, Actually, I'm not sure how to, to, to come over those problems because they are very deep, because of all these uh, very, very uh, fresh wounds uh, after the after war wounds and uh, all the situations that are not cleared yet after the, the war. And that's, I think that's something that we need to put on the side. And we need to focus on those those social and economic problems in our country because that's the main. Those problems are. I think that's the the, the, the biggest problem because we are all hungry. <laughs> Actually, on, on, on all three languages again. That's a, part, that's a part of the answer. That is a part of the answer. But uh, that, to the question that I was posing. But there's another part of the question. In terms of public perception, in order for the network to be able to be perceived as overriding the ethnic principle, you have to have groups in some place that's not the network. 
You have to have yes, a group and find a local and yes. you know, and that's something what but not just we are, That's something what we are doing uh, now. That's that's something what that we want to do now uh, to connect on or to make that network between all all cities in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Including Banja Luka, Bielina. Um, I think in Sarajevo on the on our last meeting was a guy from Gradiška also, and <laughs> different parts of Bosnia and Herzegovina. That that's something that we need to work on. We need to connect between us, and then to 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 think how to connect um, to to build those. Um, Solidarity and, or connections between people in Republika Srpska and the Federacija or Brčko or whatever. So, first of all, we need to connect. We need to organize ourselves and um, start to work together, uh, and then we'll we'll find a way how to 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 work with mass groups of of of, of people. Are you satisfied? In so yeah, and you were asking about the constitution process. Yes. Okay. So this is one of the like, like the great things that was supposed to have happened in the Icelandic Revolution, um, and the constitution process itself was like it's like a magnificent thing. Like. Like after, like when I'm kind of looking at it again, like what they managed to kind of pull through was like quite impressive. In that, like in so 2010, there was a national assembly that was like organized by a grassroots organization uh, that uh, got uh, 1,500 people together, 1,200 random elected individuals, and then 300 representatives of all kinds of organizations and industry. Uh, which kind of uh, kind of were set to kind of find out like the values of Icelandic community, kind of like, what are our like national values. Then a year later, uh, a pro parliamentary committee, so like a constitutional committee, organized another this kind of national event where like 950 individuals were, were assembled uh, randomly from the national registry to kind of focus on like a constitutional, so it's like a constitutional national committee where they would like focus on like what are the things that are important for us to have in our constitution and kind of organize around that. Um, then in uh, later in 2010, uh, a committee was, uh, it, like this constitutional committee was set to kind of organize a uh, like personal vote so like any, any Icelander could like personally say like I want to be in uh, in the in the constitutional council, and 550 individuals like stepped forward and we like voted on uh, these, and the like, 25 individuals of like all stripes of life ended up being uh, in this constitutional uh, council, uh, and it's like everything from like professors to farmers, and like it was like a good. Age difference and everything was just like a wonderful thing, and they wrote this, uh, rewrote like the constitution basically, because like the, the current constitution we have now is basically the Danish constitution from 1849, with kind of we kind of scratched over king and put president instead, <laughs> and, that's like, and that's like what we have, um, and like they have been, we have tried to make changes to it like since 1945, so 1944. It was supposed to be like a temporary document in Iceland, um, but all the changes, because like changes to the document are hard, really hard. They have to be approved by two separate uh, parliaments. So like you have to have, if you make changes, you have to like stop the parliamentary session, have an election, and then the next parliamentary also has to approve it. Um, one of the issues with this process, so like they made this wonderful document that's. Uh, was approved 25 to 0 by the Constitutional uh, Council and they um, put it to Parliament, Parliament put it to referendum uh, and it was approved by the two thirds of the, uh, of the voters uh, but because uh, referendums can't be binding in Iceland that kind of didn't mean anything, it was like more of like an opinion poll um, and uh, so what happened then is like because they had to make the 
constitutional change, like if they decide to make constitutional change and vote on it in the parliament, then they have to stop the, uh, like stop the term early, really. The politicians like waited until the end of their term. And in that process, they got filibustered quite harshly by the opposition that didn't want any constitutional changes. Um, and they never had the vote. Then uh, the opposition, like there was like 2013, there's an election again. And the, um, the right wing government got back in power. And they like said like yes this is this is very important very important we have to do this and then committee chair of the committee is opposed to constitutional change and we haven't heard anything since basically um, and like yeah so this is like and like for us like um, and uh, for my association like we this is one of the issues like we criticized very harshly in the beginning of the, this process. It's like, even though you, you kind of look at it in hindsight and I'm like, it's like really impressive, just like that we meant this much. But for example, it's like, it was not clear from the outside, like what was going to be the role of politicians in this constitutional process? Like, are they, were they allowed to like interfere in any way? Which is what they like eventually then did. Like they, there was a committee that tried to change, like we had, one of the biggest and most important clauses in the new constitution is like a natural resource clause, which states that like uh, natural resources are like the property of the Icelandic nation. It's not the state, but like the nation itself. And um, this is like the single most important clause. And like they tried to put it into a committee that kind of modified it a little bit so that it was like more like. Uh, beneficial to those who are already using the natural resources in Iceland. And, um, uh, but like quite fortunately this was like spotted by the constitutional committee that kind of like said no 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 no, no you can't do that we change this back. And uh, but so we have this wonderful wonderful document that's kind of sitting in a committee somewhere uh, waiting to become our constitution basically and kind of that's that. Yeah. Okay. Paul, you say something? Yes. yes okay, this will be the last uh, uh, intervention. <laughs> <laughs> so, so be very clever and you know. No, 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 no. <laughs> Sorry for talking right through this active listening. You know, um, just a quick thing for Aida. Perhaps, perhaps two quick things really. One, one is that. Um, I, I mean, I think there's a difference yes between a demand for a government of experts and a demand for a government of experts answerable to the plan. Both of them may be unrealistic, but I think they're, they're very different kinds of qualitative demands. But the question is, when you listed the enemies, knowing the enemies, you didn't mention SDP, and I wondered why. I didn't mention SDP because SDP is totally down on the elections. <laughs> Really, they lost, I think, I don't know, they lost 20, 30 places, I think. So many numbers, so many thousands of, num of votes they lost on these elections, but they are a, a real problem. And that's something that I wanted to say, that um, even though we had all those protests, national pa nationalistic parties won. That's something that uh, uh, is totally different of all things I, I already said, because, but um, that means that um, nationalistic parties have their, have their soldiers, have their uh, uh, armies of voters that will always vote for them. But SDP is, um, that's the party that um, disappointed us mostly. Uh, because they were so, so social democratic party and and they weren't that at all. Lagundia um, and uh, the rest of the crew. I don't know. SDP is um, maybe that's a they are. Uh, I, I I don't know how to to, to explain that. Um, um, 
don't I simply don't know how to explain. They 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 disappointed us totally. And um, on these um, on these uh, protests in my canton and most cantons, I think they had their prime ministers. In my canton, Munskosanski, uh, Hamdi Lipovacha, SDP, we wanted to to get his resignation and. As the Astranka, uh, uh, as the party, that nationalistic party, um, they try to to manage all these protests for for them in the in the forest, the benefit uh, against uh, those SDP, and that's something that they try to to play some games uh, between between them, but in. First ten days after the, the, the after the protest, they consolidate and they try to, to work together against us. Actually, we every party that was in government on any level in federation or or Republika Srpska are our problem, are our enemies. That that's 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 the right that's the the, the, the thing, but. Now we have as they are as HDZ and SNSD on on the government level, and that's why they are now our problem. SDP is down totally.